Ladies and gentlemen, that stunning face you're seeing is the stunning Ronnie Bennett. If the names are the same, it's because we used to be married, then we weren't anymore, then we didn't talk for years, then we ta started talking, and now we're the best of friends again. <laughs> which is the way we which is the way we started out, you know? That's true. That's true. We were just best friends and then you know how many years ago? That was late fifties. Oh yeah. 1960. Well, I don't know. I always I always talk about you as somebody that I, I regret that I married because I ruined a perfect friendship. <laughs> You know, I mean, really, a lot of people make that mistake. They take somebody who they really get along with and they, they have a real compatibility with. And they think that's maybe an excuse to get married. But I think the things that in, in that are needed in a marriage are different than those that are needed in a friendship. Would you agree? I mean, you got to have friendship, but there's got to be more. I don't know. I don't know. Maybe we just aren't any good at marriage. Uh, th that could be. <laughs> I've certainly proved that I'm not good at marriage. I mean, I'm on my fourth. <gasps> I didn't know it was that. I thought three. Oh, no. You were number two. I remember that. And then there was number three, mm, Susan. Right, yes. And then there's number four, Marjorie. Oh, my goodness. Yeah. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> yeah. I just never did it again. Probably to be on, the, the, first to time, be on so. the safe side, I should probably refer to her as my future ex-wife. <laughs> you know, uh, but no, I've never been. There. You know, there was a wonderful moment when I used when I worked for Barbara Walters Specials. Yeah, we were interviewing. She was hardly ever interviewed in those days. Elizabeth Taylor, mm -hmm. and we were doing it at. It's now gone. It burned down. Yeah. But that western town out in New Mexico, where they shot a lot of western movies back in those days. Mm -hmm. This was back in the eighties. So we go there, and she's. They're making one of those. Old westerns where you wear those, you know, big. The girls wear those big dresses with the big skirts and mm -hmm. and tucked in waists and all of that. And of course, I mean, she's Elizabeth Taylor, so of course she was two hours late for the interview. And um, one of the questions we'd done because at that point she had been married. I don't know six or seven times. I think maybe eight. Mm -hmm. And so the question was very very simple from Barbara of. But Elizabeth, you've been married eight times. And Elizabeth's answer was wonderful. She said, but Barbara, I married them all instead of just sleeping with them. <laughs> well, uh, maybe she would have done better by sleeping with them because they, they, they didn't last. You know, no, yeah. no. Well, she tried Burton twice, didn't she? I can't yeah, remember. She, tr she tried Burton twice. I think that was maybe her most successful marriage in a strange way. You know, I don't remember. Man. Yeah, I don't have to remember those things anymore. I used to have to do that. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I just uh, figured it was not time for me to to do that. You know, uh, uh, to to give up on marriage. I kept trying it. I, as I put it, I'm going to keep doing it till I get it right. <laughs> and are, have you done that now, finally? Uh, uh, you Be know, careful. Who, where's Marjorie? <laughs> uh, I know she's listening to this. And the way I would answer that is probably she'd probably answer it the same way. We look at each other every now and then and just say, so it's come to this, huh? <laughs> you know, we're at an age where divorce is never thought of in this relationship. Because it's ridiculous. You know, more old people, according to statistics, are getting divorced than used to. Really? Yeah. I don't know why at this point. Why Why? why suddenly at, at, at 80 do you want to be separated from the other person who's like, you know, 76 or something like that? I mean, come on. You know, it, it, you can just wait for one of them to die. You know, I mean. Well. As I say, I wake up every morning and I say, well, what is it today that's going to get me? You know, what is going to... You know, you, it, you spent your whole life with this hypochondria. Well, I got a pain Didn't in my like back. I wonder if that's age? some kind of terminal disease I've suddenly got. <laughs> Let me tell you about terminal disease. Yeah, well, uh, you're, you're, you're the textbook. <laughs> yes. <laughs> The reason she's wearing a turban, by the way, is because, uh, well, uh, she doesn't have any hair left because of uh, the chemotherapy. Uh, would you say now after the chemo, I'm gonna, I kept thinking about this because sometimes 
my wife will say to me, well, you know, if uh, what was hap- what's happening in Iran happened to me, I probably wouldn't go through, you know, the chemo and all that. I just let myself go, you know, and say, that's it, you know. And uh, so I'm wondering, is the chemo worth it, you know, compared to the quality of life? Okay, here's what I think about that. Because I'm sure you've asked yourself that question. Well, long before it started and since yeah. then, too. And uh, I, um, w- when I have the chemo, I have a f- six hours of chemo infusion. Yeah. And then I wear a body pack for two days for more at home mm-hmm. uh, that more is pumped into me. And for those two days at home, um, there's a little bit of side effect for the first day. But mostly I'm okay. Then when they unplug me... Mm-hmm. Um, that's when I start to feel the side effects. And it's mostly tiredness. And I can do a certain amount of things, but I have to take a nap or I have to rest. And rest usually means lying down, which means I usually fall asleep, so you lose a couple of hours. But by if I have, I have chemo, the infusion at the clinic, on Thursdays, every other Thursday, and I'm pretty well back as much to normal as I'm ever going to be. Um, by today, by Tuesday, Monday or Tuesday. Mm-hmm. Um, and that leaves me another 10 days of being pretty much okay. I mean, I'm not the girl I used to be. I'm very slow at things now. Um, and I just had to learn that things take twice as long to do. But my kind of deal with myself about this, uh, and the time will come, is that when the side effects or the effects of the cancer or both of them together take away daily good living Mm -hmm. for most of the time, then it will be time to go. Yeah. But so far, it's not anywhere near close to that, right? Mostly I have good days now. But, you know, that will change at some point in the future. Well, you know, I mean, um, who knows how long this chemotherapy is going to keep you going? You know, I mean, you, you, a couple of months ago, you were saying, oh, God, I'm depressed. I'm going to die and all of that. And now you seem to have a little bit more hope that at least you're going to be around for a while. You know? Yeah. I mean, it, I don't know. I mean, you um, don't have an expiration date is what I'm saying. I, yeah. I don't know what that is. And, and nobody does. Um, it, uh, as I said, when I have when when the hard times, the bad times, the side effects times are taking up more of my life than a few good days then it will be time to go by the way just this morning it was announced that the state of new jersey has made physician assisted suicide legal as of today oh good then uh, then and it will go into effect later this year um and i will certainly take care of that um i will take care of it that way when the time comes that i've been describing uh it's you just don't know when it's going to be because every there's no predicting that the advance of cancer. Everybody is different, whether they have the same kind of cancer, the same kind of chemo or whatever they're doing. Um, it's still going to affect each person differently. So, you know, as long as I've got good times, I like being here. You know? Yeah, no, no, no shit. Uh, <laughs> you know, I mean, um uh, uh, of course, you you know you you fight it, but I you know you just wonder like you know how much potchking around do you want a doctor to do before you say that's enough? Oh well, yeah. as I said, I, I explained when it's when there's more bad times than good times, it's over. Yeah, for me. But you know, the people uh, don't feel that. What way. Marjorie was saying is she wouldn't even put herself through the chemo. You know, some people don't. It depends, and I'm terribly lucky on the chemo. This is a rough chemo, and. A lot of people who are on it have a lot more and and stronger side effects than I've had so far. And I don't know why that is. I just thank God, you know, I'll take it. I like this. <laughs> I like it this way. You like it this way. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, 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 it, it changes your life entirely. I mean, this takes up, first of all, I'm only at half speed on everything, and that's never going to come back. Um and there are things like counting out pills and remembering to take them at the right times. That's really irritating. I'm not very good at that, and I have to put signs up and remind myself all over the place. Um, 
there's it's very difficult because of my breathing problems for something as simple I've done all my life is change the bed. It's really hard to do, yeah. and I have to stop and rest twice while I'm doing it. Do you do any things for exercise, like taking walks and things like that? Very, very short ones. It's very difficult for me to breathe, and even at a slow pace. So I do, you know, the best I can. Wow. And but, is the is the breathing from the chemo? The breathing is from the cancer. Okay. And possibly because I smoked for so many years. Right now, they're doing some tests and thinking about treating me for CPO, COPD. Yeah. And so we're in the middle of figuring that stuff How out. How long right did now. you smoke? Because Pardon? I know you started me smoking. I know. Do we have to go through that again? Oh, yeah. I'm going to remind you of that. Newports. I remember it was Newports. And I was so into it, I not only got the bought the Newports, I bought the Newport lighter. I had a Newport lighter that I lit my Newports with. I was a new smoker. And it was because you were a smoker. How okay. long did you keep what smoking? What do you want me to do? How, how long did you? I'm the one with CPOD, COPD. Yeah, I know. Well, how long did you smoke, though? I don't want to talk about that. Well, well I mean, I wanted, I'd like to know because I'd like to see how much further than me. I, like, I only smoked for 20 years and then I quit. Oh, I smoked much longer than that. And no. let's move on. <laughs> <laughs> Do you think that the smoking might have anything to do with the uh, with the uh, cancer in your lung, or do you think it was more? Sure. Okay. Sure. All right. Yeah. You know, I mean, if it, it's it's not just your lungs. Can, cigarettes aren't good for anything. But you remember when we were teenagers, it was a very glamorous thing. Betty Davis smoking on the, you know, and and Joan Crawford and Betty Davis and I said that. Um, Betty Grable, all those movie stars when we were very young, all of the movies, they all smoked cigarettes, very sexy. And that's how we grew up. And nobody was going to make a big deal. It was even at that time was the first announcement that they had found that cigarettes are terrible for you, but nobody really made a big deal of it. And nobody believed it in the beginning. Wow. Yeah, I um, um, I don't know. I one day I quit because I was on the radio, and somebody came by and they said we want to test you for you know your lungs and all of that you know uh, on the air. And I said, oh, okay, fine. You know what the hell? Now I like any smoker, you kind of believe nothing's happening bad to you because it's progressive. Because disease. you're young and it doesn't show you know, yet. You know you don't get the negative results of smoking for something like 20 years okay so they tested me and my breathing was down mm -hmm. and i said i always said i would quit smoking whenever i was proven to me that something was going wrong mm -hmm. and so i did it and mm -hmm. i quit smoking uh, and I was delighted that I quit smoking. And I, I one day I just said, "That's it. I'm going to quit." I remember you, you. you and I quit. <laughs> it's not once. that easy for I everybody. I remember you and I in Chicago. I think we quit, and it lasted for what three weeks or three months or something like that. I remember the birth of kitties in Chicago. The birth of cats. <laughs> oh, yeah. But but what I'm saying is, in Chicago, we uh, we 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 quit smoking. I think for something like like three days or something, uh, three months, three weeks. And and I thought we had it made, and, and we had a cigarette to see if we had it made, and we then we're smoking again. I so, think that you can't ever go back, at least I can't when you stop. I still, not very often, but a couple times a month, I still crave a cigarette, especially when I'm trying to write and I'm not getting anywhere. It's time to stop and have a cigarette, you know? Well, no, I, I never desire a cigarette, but here's how I, here's how I quit, mindset I put myself into when I quit. I, I didn't say I'm going to see uh, if I can, I'm going to quit. I didn't say I'm going to quit because then you're putting a, a barrier in front of you. But I said, I'm going to see how long I can go without smoking. And, and you're still here, huh? And, I'm, and, I'm, and I haven't smoked <laughs> since then. And I think that's the way to approach it. You know, don't approach it like it's a wall you have to climb, but that it's just a little task. You want to say, how long can I go without smoking? And I've so far it's been, what was that, 1990? No, 1982 that I quit smoking. And you're still waiting to see if you can have another cigarette? <laughs> Well, you know, if tomorrow I found out I had something terminal and I was only going to live like six months or something like that, I think I'd start smoking again and try heroin. You know, I mean, all the things that they said were terrible for you, I think I would tr go out and just try, you know. 
I want to go out in a puff of smoke. That's what I want to do. Right? <laughs> I don't know. Well, I mean, don't what were you saying about the advantages of, of having a terminal disease is that there are certain things you feel don't bother you anymore. They're inconsequential. Well, you know, I'm never going to exercise again. <laughs> You're right. Every moment of it for God knows how many years. Yeah. Every morning of my life. I just, I just spy. you know, you get up, it's a brand new day, and now you have to go do something that you can't stand. So I don't ever have to do that again. Yeah. I can eat anything I want. I need to keep my weight up. It doesn't matter what I eat. And when I complained to one of the oncology nurses that eating all this fat and protein is not how I've been eating for the last 15 years, and it's not very healthy. She said, Ronnie, keep your weight up, that the um, cancer will kill you long before the diet. <laughs> well, that's that's true. Uh, and, but, I mean, I feel that, um, uh, I don't know, when I quit, the, you know, I've always, you know, you know me, I've always been dieting one way or another. Uh, because I first found out, I used to be, remember, I, when you first met me, I was a really skinny kid. I mean, almost to the point of scrawny. All right. And Most then, people get thicker as we get And when we were in Houston, Texas, I hit, I think, 28. And I suddenly realized I had gained 15 pounds. <laughs> and, and then I suddenly realized if I don't do something about it, I'm going to have a weight problem. And so for most of my life, I've been on some kind of a diet or another, except about a, a couple of years ago, we suddenly realized I was up to 150 pounds, 250 pounds. What? Yes. 250 pounds. And I went on a, a diet or 245, I think it was when I was at the doctor. And I, you don't realize you've suddenly become enormous, right? <laughs> and so I just went on this low carb diet and I shed at, at the top point about 60 pounds. I'm down about 55, 52, between 50 and 55 pounds. All right. Mm -hmm. Uh, and, um, so once I did that, now I'm paranoid about putting it back on because I see all these people lose weight and suddenly, you know, a year later they're fat again. But I've kept this off for the most part for like two years, you know. But it 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 was it was quite a job. But then here's the point I was going to make. So I went on this low carb diet. So I ate nothing but meat and uh, eggs and you know all non carb stuff. And people went, that's bad for you. And I said, wait a minute, is that bad for me Is or is the, the 55 pounds I took off bad for me? And they can't, we all they do can't, the best we can, Alex. They can't yeah, come up with trying. an answer. Listen, I'm sick and tired of being told the things I've done all my life that were supposedly good for me are not, not good for me anymore. The baby aspirin I take every day. They say it doesn't do anything. You better stop taking it. What? You told me to take it. You know, your best medical knowledge told me to take it. Um, you know, and then it's... Uh, you know what, Alex? Yeah. You know what? What? We're old enough now that we can do anything we want. You're right. In terms of food and medicine and I'm all going that. out and having that hot fudge Sunday. doesn't matter at this point. We're going to die before a lot of other people because we're this old. I'm going to go out and have that hot fudge Sunday right now. Yes. Yeah. Go ahead. You know, I haven't had... <laughs> I haven't had a sweet like that you know i have sugar-free sweets but that's it you know i've been you know when i was very young yeah i used and i as, as soon as i hit puberty i started having a weight problem mm -hmm. and i spent my entire life losing the same 10 or 12 pounds over and over and over again and i used to mock tall skinny women who would complain about how hard it was for them to keep weight on mm -hmm. and i would mock them because they had I spent my whole life trying to keep weight off. Right. And now that I need to keep my weight up so that I don't fall into frailty, um, I, all of a sudden I understand those tall, skinny girls. I have, I work really hard to keep my weight up, and it goes away really easily. Well, we had a friend once who was a model who put on like five pounds, I think, and she was having a hard time finding work. Because they want yeah, them Mary. so, yeah, yeah. They, they want, you want, remember her name. I didn't even remember her name. She just, she had to remain skinny and scrawny, yeah. you know. Uh, they were drapes for the dresses is really what they were. 
you know, that's got to be a horrible life. Just got to be a horrible life. I remember she was kind of not happy about it. I don't remember the details. Yeah. It was a long time ago. Yeah. Uh, yeah. You know what I do remember? And I, I, I keep telling the story about we were living up in uh, up in Riverdale. No, not Archie and Veronica's Riverdale, the other Riverdale, the one in New York. And there was this I'm woman. Sorry, I thought theirs was there. Huh? I thought Archie and Veronica was that Riverdale. No, it wasn't that Riverdale. It was a town Riverdale called Riverdale, not a not an area called Riverdale. Okay. okay. But anyway, so we so we uh, and and in the building with us lived the uh, head of a major television network, or no, the, the, one, the one we worked for. The one we worked for. And uh, he had a wife, and she, one night she came down drunk, and she was pregnant. And she uh, started moaning and crying, and then I, uh, she started jumping all over me, okay? And I kind of pushed her away. I, was, I remember looking at you like, no, I'm not getting involved here, you know? And then she went after our friend Michael O'Donoghue, who was there that night. And, I have no memory of this. And she went, she went berserk on him. She's all over him, right? And then she's saying things like, uh, uh, out of, she, she was on a soap opera. And she's saying things out of the soap opera like, love, what does he know of love? <laughs> <You know? laughs> and finally, you and Michael dragged her back up to her apartment because she had almost passed out and deposited her at her front door, right? Which is the reason I think I lasted at ABC so long is because of this little favor we did to the boss, right? <laughs> but Michael O'Donoghue had spent his whole life writing parody, right, for Saturday Night Live and for the National Lampoon, mm -hmm. said to me, Jesus, I thought all these years I was writing parody. <laughs> because this was like something out of a bad soap opera, you know. So that's what I remember about Riverdale. That's, I remember another kitty birth. <laughs> oh, yeah, oh yeah, we had more cats because. <laughs> well, I often had a joke about you. I said uh, first she first she spayed a one male cat, then she you spayed another male cat, and I said I got rid of her before she got around to me. <laughs> <laughs> I did you really? Um. <laughs> I think you don't spay a male cat. I think that. Uh, that's excuse me, cast, uh, castrate, uh, uh, neuter, neuter. You know, but we you didn't. You didn't do spay any of the females. I don't have any memory of this outside of how many well, kitties. Well, and that's what I hold against you. Then try and come back at it. <laughs> <laughs> if you can't remember. Do you remember when they got ringworm and we had to try to put the salve on them every day? Every cat, a whole. Passel of cats. I think two cats had kittens at about the same time, and they all came down with ringworm. And we had to put, make them take these ringworm pills, I think. And so it was like an assembly line where you take the cat, open their mouth, I throw the pill in, then you close the mouth, and then, of course, do the tickling of the throat so they would swallow. And then it's the next cat and the next. We had to do this for like three weeks. This was... It was ridiculous. Well, that and that was our marriage, folks. <laughs> Neutering, spaying, and and uh, giving pills for ringworm. <laughs> that was it. Yeah, yeah. Because well, the reason we were we had to cure them of the ringworm is there was no way we were going to get rid of these cats unless they were cured of ringworm because they were all kittens. And then every time we go out somewhere, you'd ask whoever we were having dinner with, "How would you like a kitty?" <laughs> Did I do that? <laughs> yes. And I remember once you said that at, at dinner with Abby Hoffman and Anita, his wife. You said, uh, uh, would you like a little kitty? And Abby, without even flinching, looked back at you and said, are they good to eat? Oh, jeez. You got a better memory than I. That's a great line. <laughs> well, I remember it because Abby was always had this ability to get right to the core of your being. And when somebody says, do you want a cat? You know, you know they love cats, so you go, are they good to eat? <laughs> you know. Hey, we've uh, run out of, well, believe it or not, on this, well, this is a second pass for us. But uh, uh, I think it, it worked this time. At least I hope so. Uh, and and uh, I've had fun with this one. This has been a lot of fun. 
podcast. And the one we just recorded, which didn't complete recording, I may run anyway at some point and tell people it ends fast. But anyway. <laughs> All right. Hey, uh, it's called Time Goes By is her blog, timegoesby.net. And it's Ronnie Bennett, and it's Lake Oswego, and you're looking terrific. Thank you. Thank you.